Welcome back. Happy New Year. We're going to continue Earth science with the rotation and revolution of the Earth. A lot of this should be a review. We rotate once every 24 hours around our axis, which is tilted 23.5 degrees from a perpendicular drawn from the plane of the ecliptic. We revolve around the sun once a year, it takes 365.25 of these rotations. The most visible daily consequence of the daily rotation of the Earth is the sun rising and setting, the planets rising and setting, the stars, and the moon. Uh, we should just review the fact that the sun rises and sets in different locations along the horizon over the course of the year, rising north of um, east and west in the summer and setting e north of east and west, and then rising east and west more or less around the equinoxes and on the equinox and then rising and setting south of east and west in the winter months. We always rotate from west to east in a counterclockwise motion. We have a solar day, which is once every 24 hours from solar noon to solar noon, and we have a sidereal day. Sidereal day is the time it takes to rotate from one fixed star to the same fixed star, and that's a little bit less time. 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.091 seconds. Now, why is that different? Well, at solar noon, you're looking at the sun. Meanwhile, someone at, on the opposite side of the Earth is looking at a fixed star. To get back to solar noon, we have to rotate once, but we will also have moved one degree in our orbit around the sun because our orbit is 360 degrees. It takes about 365 days, so we are moving approximately one degree around the sun. And that changes our orientation in terms of the sun from day to day to day, but not in terms of our fixed star. So our fixed star was off in this direction. Well, 23 hours and 56 minutes, we get back to that fixed star. But we are not yet at solar noon because we moved that one degree. And if we do the math, we know that actually one degree of motion, of rotation, takes about four minutes. So this sidereal day is a little bit shorter. We accelerate at the equator at 1,674.4 kilometers per hour. We accelerate because it's a curved motion. And this acceleration approaches zero at the poles. You can determine the acceleration at any latitude by using a trigonomic function that you'll learn about in high school called the cosine. The cosine is simply the relationship between the hypotenuse of a right triangle and the side adjacent to it in relation to this angle here. So we take the distance of AC and we put it over the distance to AB. We form a simple proportion or ratio and solve that problem, getting a cosine of 0 0.707. That's a, that's a figure that is constant for any right triangle. Then, for with a 45 degree angle. Then, we simply take the 7, 0.707 and multiply it times the acceleration of the Earth at the equator, and we come up with our acceleration at our latitude of 45 degrees. And we can see from our diagram here, we've simply drawn a right triangle within the Earth, right? This is the radius of the Earth up to 45 degrees. We drop a perpendicular down, forming our right triangle. We have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. And from that, you can get this beautiful thing called the cosine of that angle. And from that, you can get the acceleration for any latitude. And all you simply do is on your calculator is you plug in whatever latitude you're interested in. So you could put cosine of 20 degrees. You would get a slightly different number here. You'd multiply it times the acceleration at the equator and get your acceleration at 20 degrees north or south latitude. The Earth rotates once every day on an axis. The axis is tilted. It's a little bit less than 23.5 degrees from an imaginary plane running through the solar system called the plane of the ecliptic. The plane of the ecliptic is this imaginary plane, like a sheet of glass upon which each planet sits, is cut in half, and every planet has a slight axial tilt in relation to that plane. Ours is 23.5 degrees. That plane of the ecliptic is also 
an imaginary area of the night sky upon which you can see all of the major objects, the sun, the moon, and the planets, move through the course of time. They are orbiting along this imaginary plane, either slightly above it, slightly or below it, or very near it, like the sun. Here are the axial tilts for the other objects in our solar system. You can see that Venus has this dramatic axial tilt of 177.3 degrees, probably because it was smashed into by something and it flipped it upside down. It rotates now in the opposite direction of all the other objects in the solar system. Our axial tilt is similar to that of Mars and Neptune and Saturn. While Jupiter and Mercury have very small axial tilts, and Uranus has this very interesting one where it's been tilted just over 90 degrees and so rotates on its side in relation to the other planets and the sun. The Earth's axis at this moment in history is always tilted in the same direction. That is towards the North Celestial Pole, Polaris, or in the Southern Hemisphere, empty space. Because we say that from day to day to day to day, the axis is always tilted in the same direction, each axial tilt or each axis of each day is parallel to the day before or the day after. So if we look at a picture of that or drew it ourselves, imagine 365 little Earths here, all tilted in exactly the same manner. Therefore, each axis of each day is parallel to every other one. That's the idea of parallelism. This, of course, changes through time over a 26,000-year period through a process called precession, the wobble of our axis. There are two proofs of the Earth's rotation. The Foucault pendulum, a freely swinging pendulum, will maintain its rate and direction of motion as the Earth rotates under it. This was, def this was first experimentally demonstrated by this gentleman called Jean Foucault in Paris in the 1800s. He hung a pendulum from the top of the dome of the Pantheon, a large building in Paris, and he created a pendulum that was always swinging in the same plane of oscillation, never varied. It always was swinging in that same plane, and therefore he could demonstrate the Earth through time over the course of a day, over hours, that the, the floor and the building itself had rotated under that plane of oscillation. And if we take a quick look at this little animation, we can see what we're talking about. So here we've put the Foucault pendulum in a thought experiment at the North Pole, and we are swinging it back and forth while the Earth rotates under it. And again, the plane of oscillation is this white area along which the pendulum is always swinging. And the Earth, anything under that swinging plane that oscillating pendulum, anything under it just moves under it. And therefore you can demonstrate rotation. Foucault did, actually conducted his experiment in Paris where because of this change in relation of angle based on this curved surface, you get a, a pendulum that um, oscillates and the floor rotates under it only 264 degrees in 24 hours, and that approaches zero as you reach the equator. Where this experiment obviously works is at the North Pole. The experiment was attempt or the South Pole, and the experiment was actually attempted by people at the South Pole and demonstrated to, to work there quite well. So the Foucault pendulum is a way in which we satisfied ourselves before satellites that the Earth was rotating. The Coriolis effect is a second way in which we've satisfied ourselves that the Earth rotated. And that is because fluids, which are defined as liquids and gases, on the surface of the Earth flow in a direction deflected from a straight path because of our rotation. So in the northern hemisphere, a fluid, the wind or water, will be deflected to the right, and in the southern hemisphere to the left. And let's look at a little video that demonstrates this. If you've ever watched the news during a hurricane or wintertime nor'easter, you've probably noticed that big storms spin over time as they travel. 
In the northern hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. But if you were watching a storm in the southern hemisphere, you'd see it spinning clockwise. Why do storms spin in different directions depending on their location? And why do they spin in the first place? A storm's rotation is due to something called the Coriolis effect, which is a phenomenon that causes fluids like water and air to curve as they travel across or above Earth's surface. Here's the basic idea. Earth is constantly spinning around its axis from west to east. But because Earth is a sphere and wider in the middle, points on the equator are actually spinning faster around the axis than points near the poles. So imagine you were standing in Texas and had a magic paper airplane that could travel hundreds of miles. If you threw your airplane directly northward, you might think it would land straight north, maybe somewhere in Nebraska. But Texas is actually spinning around Earth's axis faster than Nebraska is because it's closer to the equator. That means that the paper airplane is spinning faster as well. And when you throw it, that spinning momentum is conserved. So if you threw your paper airplane in a straight line toward the north, it would land somewhere to the right of Nebraska, maybe in Delaware. So from your point of view in Texas, the plane would have taken a curved path to the right. The opposite would happen in the southern hemisphere. An object traveling from the equator to the south would get deflected to the left. So what is this? So we're going to stop right there because we don't need to go into the section on hurricanes quite yet. But the bottom line is that we get this Coriolis effect with wind and water on the surface of the Earth. And we can look at it from another point of view here, which is to say that if we were now throwing our paper, la par paper airplane from the North Pole south, we would get the opposite. And again, another deflection to the right, always observing that deflection from the point of view of that object moving away from you, the observer. So here on a non-rotating Earth, the object would just go straight south, straight south. But on a rotating Earth, because you would be throwing your paper airplane at a slower initial velocity, the Earth, as that a paper airplane traveled south at that same initial velocity, would be traveling faster and faster under it. Therefore, the paper airplane lags behind and lands to the right of the initial longitude that you started at. And again, you, these are the longitudes of the Earth that can be used to assess this. So the Coriolis effect is a real thing and actually has a lot of um, practical applications in rocketry and for the military shooting um, artillery shells and, and anything that moves through the atmosphere, including the weather. And we can see that in our reference table on page 14, we have a map what's called of what's called, or a diagram of what's called the global surface winds. And we're not interested in the arrows on the outside here, but on the inside, we are looking at a diagram of winds that are frequently blowing. They are um, predictable winds that blow from 30 degrees north to the north, towards 60 north, and rather than blowing in a straight line from 30 north, they are all deflected, these global winds to the right. They likewise, the same 30 north, has winds that blow predictably to the south. And again, if we flip our point of view, we would see them deflected to the right. In the southern hemisphere, along the same latitude, this time 30 south, deflected to the left, deflected to the left, deflected to the left, going from north to south. Because global winds create ocean currents, we see the same pattern in ocean currents, where they are deflected to the right, these ocean currents, in the northern hemisphere, and deflected to the left in the southern. I mentioned that there is a change to our, the direction at which our um, axis points over time, and that we call precession. Over a 26,000 year period, the Earth's axis of rotation slowly wobbles. And again, this is called precession. Here we see it where we are currently pointed at Polaris. We will wobble around over 26,000 years and come back to it. 
in that time, we will have other stars that will form what are considered to be a North Star. Um, but for the moment, we are lucky. We have Polaris. There are times in the Earth's history where there is no noticeable Northern Polaris star. Or Northern Polar star. There is one Polaris. So, why does it have this wobble? Well, because we're an oblate spheroid, remember. The sun and the moon act on our equatorial bulge slightly differently than the rest of the surface, and that creates a slight wobble to our rotation. We also have two other slow changes in the Earth's motion. One is called our Earth's orbit's eccentricity, and the other is our axial tilt and obliquity, called obliquity. The eccentricity of the Earth's orbit varies or deviates from a perfect orbital circle because of the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn over time. And our axial tilt changes over time because, again, of the gravity of the moon, sun, and planets. So you see, not being alone in the solar system impacts all of our Earth motions. When those three changes in Earth motions act together, a scientist some 100 years or so ago determined that there was an impact on climate which were named after the scientist and called Milankovitch cycles. And he determined over a uh, several hundred thousand year period, you could get a predictable cooling and warming of the Earth, patterns of glaciation and warming. And again, based on these changes, because of course, when you change the axial tilt, you change the amount of solar energy striking different parts of the Earth. When you change the eccentricity, you pull the Earth farther or closer to the sun by a small amount. When you change the direction of, of um, the Earth's axis, where it points, you also change the relationship to the sun slightly. So all these together can change climate. A most important consequence of the Earth's diurnal, this is a word you need to know, diurnal daily rotation, is that the constant uneven heating of one side of the Earth goes on while the other side is always cooling. So this is a most important consequence of our daily rotation. The constant, uneven heating of one side of the Earth while the other side cools. Day and night, night and day, all the time, diurnal change.